joining the um, um, session. So my name is Gerwin Havekamp. I'm the, the executive director of the World Benchmarking Alliance, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you together with Accountancy Europe um, on this session on the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, this is, from our perspective, a very exciting piece of legislation, which is not a given, of course, with new legislation, but there is a real opportunity for with this uh, with the CS. RD, we'll have to get used to that acronym, um, to really make a big difference in the field of corporate um, sustainability disclosures. From the perspective of the World Benchmark Alliance, this is absolutely vital. Um, if we look at it from as an organization that is assessing uh, the most influential companies in, in the world on their contribution to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we really believe uh, that we need to move from a voluntary to a mandatory regime when it comes to corporate sustainability reporting. There's also a great need to make sure that we work towards a harmonized standard. Um, and of course, all of this should have a real impact in the world, on the world. So it is really, really important from our perspective that these disclosures are really aligned with the Paris Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And then the other more in the context of Europe, uh, societal outcomes that we uh, want to achieve. So from this perspective, um, in this new directive is really, really welcomed, um, but it will have big implications um, and it will be difficult to get it right. Um, and so this really, it's sort of a fresh, uh, in, the, in this, this report has sort of been freshly launched. Um, so this is really one of the first opportunities uh, to discuss it and uh, to have a first look at its uh, implications. And so therefore we are really, really excited that we'll hear uh, both from the institutions uh, that will be responsible for developing and implementing this, um, as well as getting some expert re um, responses, both from the accountancy perspective, as well as from an investor's perspective and, and from providers. Um, a few housekeeping things. Um, we will record this session. So that means that everything that you, um, uh, everything that is shared uh, will be recorded. And we really, really would like to keep this an interactive um, uh, discussion and debate. And the way you can help doing that is by posting all of your questions in the chat. Um, so we'll keep an eye on them um, and bring them to the to the uh, speakers and respondents. Uh, and if you really like a question or think it's highly, uh, if you see a highly relevant question in the chat, uh, you can endorse that by uh, giving it a thumbs up. So that means that it makes it a bit easier for us to get sort of a sense of where the energy is and where people want to talk about. Um, so please do that um, and um, we'll keep this sort of high pace uh, and to keep it dynamic as Olivier from we, we just had in the pre-chat from Accounting Europe said let, let's really make this a debate. So I propose we also do this on a sort of a first name uh, basis so we can keep this uh, session as interactive as possible. So that's it from my end. Um, I would really like now I'd like to turn to Elena from FISMA uh, to give a sort of a seven minute intro uh, into what has been launched and what's behind it uh, and what we can expect in the coming months. Elena, can I hand it over to you? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Governor. So as you say, I think, first of all, the, the name of the directive is something we'll all need to get used to. But I already think that's a very good first step towards the right direction. Uh, I think the, the aim of the Commission at the end of the day is to put sustainability reported on an equal footing uh, with financial reporting. So by moving away from this terminology of non-financial, I think we're, we're already even starting. So on the CSRD itself, uh, as you all know, it's very important in order to, to, to meet the objectives of the Green Deal that this transparency is enabled and that this key element of the sustainable finance agenda adds to, to this uh, uh, aim of reallocating capital to more sustainable companies. So in the first place, it's needed, this revision is needed to enable investors assess risks stemming from all these sustainability matters. It's also needed, as I said, to, to allow investors allocate capital in, in more sustainable companies, in those companies that address the sustainability crisis and that do not exacerbate it. And also it is aimed to enable any stakeholder to, to hold companies uh, accountable for their impacts on the environment and people. So these are the main objectives of the revision. That's what's behind it. And as I said, 
this fits into the, the whole sustainable finance agenda and the Green Deal, of course. And it's a, a very important and a major step towards achieving it, because what we have assessed is that current reporting isn't, isn't fit, basically, for, for this purpose. We find that information is not comparable enough, is not relevant enough all the times. Relevant information is often hidden among all the, all the not that relevant information in the eyes of, of users. And uh, information is in many occasions not reliable. So if we have information that no one can use, there's no point in companies making the effort and, and there is a, a real need to improve this situation. So how does the proposal uh, suggest to, to do that basically? So first of all, uh, our analysis uh, concluded that there's many companies from which investors and other stakeholders like civil society organizations would like to see sustainability information and they are currently not required to report or not voluntarily doing so. So first of all, uh, the proposal includes an expansion of the personal scope of application of, the, of these EU rules. Uh, it proposes to include all large companies as defined in, in EU legislation, concretely in the accounting directive, and also all listed companies, excluding micro undertakings. This is this this both aspects are, are very important from, from an investor protection perspective, but also in order to, to have information from, from the largest share of companies that may have very big impacts on environment and, and people. There's there's no argument to to have no reporting from an unlisted undertaking if what we are also interested in is on those impacts. So in that respect, uh, this is a very significant change. There will be a different uh, approach for SMEs. Uh, they will be given a three years phase in to in order to comply with these requirements and they will also be allowed to use uh, SME standards. So this brings me to the second very big aspect of the of the proposal and the, the centerpiece of, of the proposal basically, which are the, the standards, the famous EU standards and, and the adoption of these EU standards by the Commission. Uh, these standards we believe are as I say, a center, the centerpiece of the proposal, because they will allow for that information reported by companies to be comparable, to be relevant, and also they allow other aspects to, to be of, um, of, of greater effect, if you like, in the context of the proposal. Uh, one of them being uh, assurance, so basically the audit of that information, a uh, reporting standard is needed in order for the auditor to take compliance against some kind of, 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 of reference point, if you like. Also, in terms of digitalization, it's, uh, it's basically almost impossible to be able to tag, to label particular bits of, bits of the information, sorry, if uh, there is no, no structure in the reporting, no, no concrete uh, uh, content that, that is harmonized uh, among all companies. And also, finally, for, for supervisors, and I'm sure Alessandro will touch upon this point after, after my intervention, I, we also make their lives easier because there's something to, to look at as reference point in the same case as for auditors to see uh, whether a company is, is properly compliant with the law. So that's why it's a, a very important element of the, of the proposal. And, that, and as regards the European approach, as you may also know, and Patrick will intervene later during this uh, very interesting panel, uh, EFRAG has already developed a couple of reports. First one on the on preparatory work for the development of these standards, where they included some technical recommendations on how these standards should look like. And then a second report uh, by the chairman of EFRAG on the governance changes that EFRAG would need to, to encounter in order to develop these, these uh, standards. So basically, this European approach is needed to respond to the European specificities. specificities sorry. Uh, we have the SFDR in place, we have the taxonomy in place. We need to ensure this consistency in the reported information. We need to ensure that the relevant information that financial market participants need is reported by investee companies. And we also need that democratic oversight of the content of this information. We believe this is even more delicate that, than financial reporting. We are talking about human rights, we're talking about environmental impact. So it's very important to have this European approach. At the same time, we also need the rapid adoption of these standards, because as I said, we have other EU legislation in place that has already kicked in or will kick in next year. And also the, the crisis is, is, is very important and to address. And we have certain targets in the EU that our other jurisdictions basically do not have. And of course, it's also important to, to address 
this information from the double materiality perspective that, that we support in the EU and to cover all ESG matters, basically. So basically, there's nothing that we could have taken off the shelf and use as a standard for, for EU purposes. And even the ongoing initiatives at global level seem to start or seem to, to have the focus at, at a first stage, at least on climate related information only. So in this respect, the European approach is needed. But of course, uh, the idea and that's very clearly set out in the in the proposal is to build on existing elements of, of existing standards and also to take into account any international initiative that that may arise. There is even a mechanism to revise the standards as needed also to take into account any developments at global level. So this is a very important aspect for us. We don't want to create fragmentation. We believe it's it's very possible to, to ensure a, a coherent framework. And, and in this respect, we also believe that this uh, co-constructive approach, this two-way cooperation between global initiatives and these EU standards is very much needed. But I won't touch more upon this point because I think the second panel will really focus on the standards issue. So as I said, the personal scope, uh, the, the standards reporting requirement, and then other requirements like the digitalization of this sustainability information or the or the requirement to verify the information. So this assurance requirement that we are now including in the proposal that is also partly enabled because of this uh, availability of or this future availability of reporting standards are main elements of the of the Commission's proposal that we believe will make a very big difference in the way in which information is reported by companies and in the way that this information is exploited by users and 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 that users basically uh, will be able to trust and therefore the efforts would not be in vain uh, there would be a, a very clear use of this information and and we also hope and expect that we can very clearly communicate how companies can can benefit from this and and see this as an opportunity for them and not just uh, a cost exercise and a source of burden I'll, I'll leave it there because I think I'm, I'm already over my time, uh, but happy to discuss later. Alina, that was perfectly within seven minutes and, and crystal clear. So thank you very much for, for that outline, very clear where the uh, Commission is coming from and the approach that you're taking. I think, the as you said, the European leadership is on these issues is really, really welcomed. Um, but of course, we are talking about global issues. Um, so as you said, in the next panel, it will be really interesting to see how we are going to sort of square that European uh, approach. Um, with 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 a, with a similar need to sort of create global convergence, um, but as you said, we'll leave that for the for the next panel to sort of unpack a little bit further. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for you, so we'll we'll welcome those in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, Alessandro, can I please give the floor to you? Thank you, thank you, uh, Gerbrand, and uh, thanks to uh, WBA and Accountancy Europe for inviting me today to represent ESMA. I'll share a few reflections on how uh, the CSRD proposals uh, have the potential to improve the status quo compared to uh, the NFRD. Many things have been touched upon by uh, Elena already. Uh, uh, overall, I think I can say that uh, the CSRD proposals go into the right direction of addressing a number of shortcomings under the NFRD, which uh, ourselves as ESMA have identified in the past years uh, also in response to the Commission consultation on the NFRD. If I were to uh, summarize, I think the uh, CSRD has a major, is a major improvement in terms of accountability. Uh, and this has really three perspectives. One is the increased specificity of the requirements. Uh, this will uh, make it easier for issuers to know what they are expected to be accountable for and also to know uh, uh, what investors will look for in terms of the specific data points and information. Uh, so very good to see the reporting areas more uh, better specified uh, and also the message that Elena gave to bring a non-financial reporting, I shall say today, a sustainability reporting at the same pace as financial reporting is indeed uh, very, very welcome. Uh, one of the things that will also increase specificity is clarity on the role that uh, the CSRD has vis-a-vis -vis third country issuers listed in the EU. This will be covered, uh, which was not crystal clear under the existing uh, regime. 
uh, and therefore that will also help uh, uh, bring in more clarity amongst listed entities. Uh, standardization is another key element of improvement in terms of specificity of the requirements. Uh, there, uh, there is a strong, uh, I think, empowerment in the Commission's proposal to EFRAG, which uh, did uh, uh, quite a substantial job uh, on the preparatory work. Obviously, uh, as we enter a phase that is closer to rulemaking than to mere uh, preparatory work, it will be important to get the governance of EFRAG right uh, in terms of the principles that the CSRD sets out, such as proper due process, public oversight and transparency. Uh, and also very important to uh, increase the specificity also when it comes to uh, understanding how the European standards will cope with international initiatives. This is something that we still need to understand. Uh, it's good to see that the door is open to uh, international initiatives, also to the review of the standards once they will be in place uh, to uh, um, adjust anything that needs to be adjusted to reflect international initiatives. But concretely, we need to see how this plays out. The risk is concrete as well of market uh, uh, fragmentation, so we don't want to go there and uh, definitely, we, we need to uh, find a good uh, cooperation with international initiatives. Uh, the second point that increases uh, accountability is uh, the improved control ecosystem that the CSRD proposals somehow uh, introduce. I, I, I think about, first of all, the improved control system that will come hopefully from uh, the responsibility statement that is now clearly set out in the proposal for senior management, senior executives, administrative bodies uh, of issuers to take responsibility of the sustainability reporting. That explicit statement, uh, I believe, will help bringing more debate and more um, uh, discussions on sustainability uh, in the boardroom. Uh, the second uh, point of uh, the, the, to improve the control environment that the CSRD will facilitate is obviously audit uh, that uh, we very much support uh, in terms of mandatory requirement. As ESMA in the NFRD consultation, we very much uh, supported the idea of mandatory audit, perhaps with a reasonable assurance already uh, on day one for quantitative information and then moving more towards uh, a full reasonable assurance uh, in a few years. Uh, we understood that this was not feasible at this stage, so uh, it, it's still welcome to see uh, the, re the, the limited assurance uh, to at least as a starting point. The third point, obviously, on, on the improved ecosystem uh, of controls is the enforcement side. Uh, we, as ESMA, since 2018, have gathered European authorities to discuss cases on sustainability reporting. Uh, we have published enforcement priorities uh, and reported back on the enforcement uh, uh, activity on a yearly basis. Uh, but still, uh, the powers of uh, national competence authorities under the uh, NFRD are not as clear as they will be under the CSRD. So again, a good uh, development there. Uh, also, the um, better coordination between the transparency directive and the accounting directive is something that was to is totally missing today under the NFRD that will again improve uh, and help closing the gap between the uh, financial reporting enforcement and sustainability uh, reporting. And also it's good to see that there is a proposed empowerment to ESMA to issue guidelines to foster convergence uh, even more. A third point, uh, a last point on accountability, I think is the uh, focus on the sustainability transition that these disclosures will somehow force. It will uh, require issuers to uh, be held accountable for their efforts towards the transition towards a, clear, a greener economy. Uh, this is not obvious. I think uh, several parties are asking for this today. Uh, to see more of the transition plans of companies uh, rather than already seeing uh, or, or, or giving a message that everyone is already uh, uh, on, on uh, is already a green company. I think there is a lot of work to do to become green, uh, 
uh, and therefore this needs to uh, come across transparently from the disclosure. So it's good to see that uh, the uh, CSRD also pushes into that direction and that links to the disclosures required or proposed uh, on value chains, on supply chains, for example, uh, that links to the need for SMEs to uh, disclose uh, information in, in this area and that also uh, links to the fact that the CSRD proposals call strongly for connectivity between other pieces of sustainable finance legislation. I think about the CSR, the, the SFDR, the taxonomy regulation. So it's good to see that there is connectivity envisaged uh, there. So I'll stop here and, and thanks very much for the opportunity again. Alessandro, thank you very much. And I'm really intrigued by the, the emphasis that you've put a couple of times in your intervention around uh, accountability. Because um, I think this is really an important um, area of, of corporate disclosure. And really, if we sort of look at it from an area where we've talked about corporate social responsibility towards a need for more transparency, I think your intervention was really in tune with the time where we now sort of move towards how do we make sure that we hold each other uh, accountable uh, on these commitments and, and on the, the, these transitions that we need to make not only in climate, but also in a lot of other areas like social inclusion um, and biodiversity. Um, and this, this point about accountability, I think is also a nice um, segue to um, two interventions that we uh, and responses that we're now going to get um, one from a perspective of accountants and one from a perspective of um, investors, as, a, as has been identified by both Elena and Alessandra as, as a very important user group of the information that will be disclosed. But of course, also accountants from this what you briefly touched upon, Alessandro, about this point about verification, uh, which is currently very, very limited with existing uh, disclosure um, frameworks. So, Rami, really keen from you to hear uh, sort of what you see as the big implications for this and, and how you see this moving forward. Well, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor and uh, having me uh, in this uh, in this panel and um, I will uh, let, let me start by by stating, I think, like uh, the other panelists, that uh, I think the CSRD is, um, is a big improvement and a big step uh, forward. And 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 for many reasons, uh, and I will I will pick three, and and the, the first one will, will be directly linked to your to your question and the, the previous intervention. Uh, it's it's I think it's uh, it's really uh, paving the way uh, of a sustainable reporting that will be. Uh, uh, similar, uh, this will have the same importance of, uh, will have the same status of financial reporting. Uh, and you can see this in uh, in many uh, requirements. Accountability was, was mentioned, uh, but you can also add the role of the audit committee in uh, monitoring the, 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 the process, the production process and the, the internal control framework and the requirement for uh, audit and, and others also a requirement. And it's sending probably two important messages. One, that this information is as much as important as financial information, which will probably experience more and more in the in the future at, at the, these things evolve. But also that the quality uh, of this information should all be also be uh, the same as, as financial information, which is also another important development that, that we see, uh, I think. Another point and that has been mentioned is that that um, uh, the the, uh, the proposal is is inclusive? Uh, listed SMEs are part of the scope, and uh, there is uh, a voluntary uh, proposal standard for for SME with an adapted standard uh, that will be proposed. And I think that's that's better. I mean, we we have in mind the proportionality issue, but it's better to have the the SME part of the system than rather outside of the system which actually they cannot be because they're part of the economy and, and the stakeholder uh, will and are already asking them information. And third, uh, it has been also mentioned, uh, the, the standards uh, is uh, probably the most important change uh, that will that will happen. Um, and, and, and with the standard, we, we can have uh, assurance as well. Uh, we need a standard to have assurance. We cannot do it without uh, a, a proper standard. It has been said, but but uh, and we've seen this also in the in the financial information and the, in the risk information. If you have abundant information, but from for many company, 
but you cannot compare them. Uh, you cannot. You don't know what's behind them really in terms of definition, and and, and sometimes you cannot easily access them. Uh, then uh, it's like if you couldn't use them actually, and and this is the same thing for sustainable reporting that have many many multiple dimensions. So the the ability uh, to have a standard and to have mandatory, well-defined information, either generic or sectorial, I think will make a, a big difference in the usage of the information and the speed of transformation that, that, that we need going forward. Now, if I, if I look at some, some important points, uh, maybe, uh, to have in mind um, in, in the roadmap, in the implementation plan, um, um, and I would like to link this to the overall objective, actually, that 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 we have, which is not a reporting objective. It's a it's a transformation objective. What we what we need is not a reporting per se. It's not uh, being compliant in the reporting. It's not being nice in the reporting. Is is it is how we how we transform our economy toward a sustainable uh, e economy, which leads me to quick three three uh, reflection. First one. I believe in transparency, in uh, reporting, in uh, uh, sustainability performance. Uh, I think it can do a lot, but I'm not sure it can do everything. So uh, we also need a clear uh, direction, regulation, sectoral regulation, and also market incentive like uh, carbon price, for instance. So again, it had been said, um, the, the standards uh, will have uh, to be linked with uh, existing policies. Uh, and Europe has already sectorial policies that are in place. And, and the, the, it has even, it has been mentioned, uh, reporting policy, reporting requirements. So we, we probably did this in a weird way, uh, starting by asking the financial institution to report before the corporate report, uh, starting to ask reporting as a taxonomy reporting that is granular before we get the, the, the basics uh, done. Um, so it's a, it's a bit a weird construction, but I, mean, I think it's there. Uh, and, and we need to have in mind that the, the reporting, the standard should ease, uh, learn about this, uh, this reporting and make everything uh, consistent. And lastly, probably the most important information, which can pose some issue about assurance as well, but I think it's the most important and, and production of information, is the target. Uh, since we, we think about the transformation of economy, uh, the, the corporate, uh, the, the target they will set, short term, medium, long term, the ability to assess whether these targets are, are credible or not, is probably the, the, the most defining uh, information that we need going forward uh, so that we will have the, the transformation right. Uh, so I, I stopped there. I hope I was uh, on time. And thank you, Rami. And, and, and thank you for the reminder that, of course, corporate disclosure and transparency is only uh, part of the story and uh, uh, probably an essential part of the story to get companies to transform. But that's ultimately the 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 aim that why we're all doing all of this and that will to a large well, to some extent or maybe a large extent will depend on about how financial institutions use this uh, data um, in their engagement with companies uh, but ultimately as Alina sort of started out her intervention at the beginning uh, impact the flow of capital towards companies that are driving the transformations and move it away from companies that might be hindering the transformation whether that's in climate nature and biodiversity or inequality. So, Michael, really excited to have you here um, and to get some of your perspective on how you think um, the CS, I'm just going to say it a few times and I will get part of our vocabulary, the CSRD, how that is going to impact uh, your work. Thanks. The floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thanks. So I'm, um, I'm speaking on behalf of BNP Paribas Asset Management, so uh, on the investor arm of uh, BNP, just to uh, clarify. So uh, really speaking on the investor side here. Um, so I'm not going to uh, repeat everyone uh, what what everyone has said before me, which I uh, really um, 
um, I'm quite aligned with, but wanted to emphasize why uh, I believe it's really important to have more standardized ESG information and on a larger scope. I will use uh, I will use the word directive so to avoid <laughs> having the word uh, CSRD uh, and uh, the acronym uh, wrong uh, wrongly. So uh, for an investor perspective, I mean there is for me three important elements that I want to emphasize and why why this directive is important. The first point is for investment decision. Uh, it has been said a little bit, but I want to emphasize a little bit on that aspect. The second part is on stewardship engagement activity. And the third reason is for to meet our own uh, requirement as, as investor uh, and link to current, uh, current other regulation. Uh, so first of all, for investment decision, that's obvious, but um, we need to capture opportunity and risk related to sustainability issue, issue sustainability issue, impact long-term valuation of our investment. And in order to, of course, better assess risk and opportunity re related to our to sustainability, we need to have reliable uh, information, standardized information on the larger scope that we can. Uh, so uh, that's obvious what I'm going to say, but that's really important that that, that directive is really key for us uh, for uh, assessing uh, and for uh, our investment decision. Um, Elena said that uh, also, I mean, and that's that's really key if we want to channel investment towards more environmental friendly activities. Um, we need as investor, of course, to know uh, the sustainability impact of companies uh, in which we invest to make such a decision. And uh, we need to have uh, more uh, information and transparency towards uh, to, towards uh, ESG, uh, ESG and climate friendly activities uh, in order to make such uh, such investment. So that's that's really the first point that uh, that is key uh, investment decision that uh, that needs to be uh, to, to be done in the most uh, thorough way. Um, the second consideration that I want to emphasize is towards uh, stewardship and engagement and why I really believe this directive will will help will help us as investor. Um, when we engage, when we vote with company, we talk with, with, with the company we invest and of course we take into account sustainability in the discussion that we have and quite often the engagement is really towards understanding better where the company is and to compare this company with peers and to potentially push um, this company to improve their practices. Uh, and uh, quite often when we have engagement with company, we discuss what, what are the best practices of the sector, what your peers are doing, where are you? Uh, and for that, of course, we need standardized information. We need more standardized information that we have, uh, and this directive will clearly help to have this common framework uh, and will help investors to fulfill their stewardship uh, duties and work and to engage with, uh, with, with companies on uh, on uh, on climate consideration, on environmental consideration, etc. Uh, so investments to achieve, and the last uh, is of course to meet our own regulation. Uh, Rami has just said it. I mean, we we ask investor first uh, to, uh, to 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 integrate uh, to integrate integrate sustainability risk uh, before really having this second uh, second directive uh, for corporates. Uh, we had just our SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation Directive, that was in force uh, a few few months ago in March, and that, that we had to disclose uh, as investor how we uh, meet our own uh, requirement uh, to sustainability risk, to integrate sustainability risk, uh, and uh, to categorize product uh, that are uh, that are uh, meeting a sustainability investment objective or that are integrated ESG, ES, ES, environmental and social characteristic. And of course, uh, for that purpose, we are we have limitation if we do not have uh, standardized uh, information on sustainability. Um, and there is so th there is SFDR, there is MIFI two directive that is coming up, where basically the clients and we already seen that. I mean, more and more clients for good reason are want to invest on sustainability product uh, and the MIFI 2 will even emphasize more uh, that to add sustainability preference to the clients, uh, to, to our clients uh, analysis and uh, to propose products uh, that will be 
towards uh, sustainability, uh, sustainability investment. And of course, with that, we'll need to have communication from companies, uh, especially regarding the regarding taxonomy compliant uh, activities uh, under the taxonomy regulation for us to really have financial instruments that will be invested uh, on on uh, on taxonomy compliant activities. Um, so so really this connectivity that was said a, li a little bit before with all these uh, all the EU uh, regulation uh, EU, EU package uh, is really key as an investor to meet our own uh, regulation. Uh, we need to have a larger scope of companies that disclose such information, which this directive will help of, us. More standardized information again, this directive will help. And uh, and what will be a challenge for the next panel to answer is it, uh, its improvement, but it's still going to be the challenge as uh, as what to do with non uh, with companies that will not be covered by this uh, EU directive uh, as we are a global investor and investing worldwide. But I know that this panel, the other panel, will discuss uh, more more broadly this issue. Um, so, uh, so that's that's the key message that I wanted to 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 to, to give, and the, and the three three pillars that I wanted to to give, and leave uh, enough time now for uh, for the interactive and Q and A part. Thank you so much for providing that perspective. Um, I um, I see a question in the the chat, um, but before we we get to that question, I'll um, I'll allow I'll allow myself to ask one. And I'm um, Alina. I'm going to direct it to you, to you, but I could have done it to everyone. There is this sort of this notion that we, I think, the if we, if, if I listen to all the interventions, then the 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 the, the fact that the NR, NR, that's or not the NFRD anymore, the CSRD is going to standardize stuff that is going to make things more precise, more comparable, is really the thing that is going to be welcomed. And at the same time, we all know that we live in a world of sustainability that is fundamentally dynamic, right? Science is evolving, societal expectations are constantly evolving. Um, this is something that I'm, I see Michael nodding. I'm sure that you get from your client, right? The one thing next day they want to know about ocean plastics, and then we get Black Lives Matters, and it's all about inequality. And so, how are we going to square this um, this thing? On the one hand, that we want, of course, predictable and uh, regulation, and we want to make sure that we get standardized and comparable uh, data. And on the other hand, the world that is real and and messy. Um, and moves in all sorts of different ways. Um, I'm not asking you to give a concluding remark because I think it's impossible, but I just want to sort of get a sense from you about how uh, FISMA is thinking about that. Sure, thank you for the question. Well, in the first place, in the proposal itself, there's already uh, uh, contemplated the possibility to, to review these standards. So basically, the Commission is obliged itself in the proposal basically to revise these standards every th three years. If needed, it can do so at any time. So the, the idea is that this is a, a living animal and indeed that it adapts to, to new technologies or to new needs as needed and even to align uh, as necessary with any global initiative. Having said that, it's true that uh, the, the idea is not to keep changing fundamental bits of the standards all the time, because then we we, we would drive everyone crazy and, and this harmonization process would make no sense. So I think in this respect also the sectoral approach that the standards foresee, that the proposal foresees for the standards is going to be key. Um, even if technologies evolve and new issues may arise, which we are very aware of, and as you say, we, we see this, of course, as, as a challenging point for the standardization process. Even if that's the case, it's true that uh, certain aspects will be more relevant for, for some sectors. So I think the, the different tier approach that uh, FREC suggested in their recommendations in April with uh, sector agnostic disclosures, sector specific disclosures and more entity specific disclosures will also allow to, to have that continuity because indeed maybe for a, for a particular sector, uh, some aspects are more relevant. And then even if, if these evolve in a way, uh, I, I think we cannot expect huge variations. Of course, keeping in mind that this is a very dynamic uh, area and that if needed and as needed, these standards will be updated. But as you say, uh, we'll have to see as we go, but we are aware of, of, of that. And, and it's important that the legal framework allows for that flexibility because uh, there's no point in creating something that is obsolete in three years time. We, we need to keep it live. And it's kind of similar to the process with financial reporting. Uh, all, all the IFRSs are also revised and so on. So 
yeah, very good question. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. That to me at least was a very reassuring answer. So th thanks so much for providing that. The question, the chat is coming alive. So I'm going to start with a question from Andrew Jones uh, for Michael. How will this impact um, the fact that non-listed companies are uh, included? And this may be a question for you from a sort of an asset management point of view, but I can also imagine this has implications for you as a bank if you're in a position to comment on that. Sure, sure. So I mean, there, there are. I mean, um, maybe I mean there, there are still some scope of improvement. I would say on the regulation. While, uh, for example, I mean, I know that as part of an asset management, we might be um, concerned by this directive, especially for our ETF product. I know that there is a debate towards that, which probably doesn't make sense uh, for some scope to be included uh, and maybe larger on. Uh, so, so, so I think that the scope uh, will be important, and I mean we have some investment on uh, on on non-listed equities also. Uh, uh, so I think that it's um, you sh of course I mean the vast majority is going to be unlisted corporate, and it will include. As said, we not include we're not investing only in European uh, stocks. Of course, I mean it's a small part of this, so that, that's the challenge of the second panel to answer these questions. Um, but uh, but clearly it's going to be important. Uh, to cover non-listed because there are some investment uh, on non-listed and it's going to be uh, valuable for us as investor also for private equity investment. Uh, it's going to be valuable, of course, for corporate for their supply chain uh, to, to to cover uh, more uh, companies that are not going to be uh, that were not targeted as of today. Thank you. And uh, there's a very relevant question from uh, MJ about the um, about companies not listed or registered in the EU, but I'm, I'm going to ask Olivier to pick that up in the next panel if that's possible. I see a question from Suzanne. Uh, Susanna, sorry, um, Alessandro, would you be able to, to take that one? So how how do you view the ex ex exemption of large companies that are part of the corporate uh, corporate groups? Yes, uh, I think that that is a um, that that that's an important question. Um, I heard uh, that some uh, parties, uh, I think some NGOs as well, are a bit concerned by this exemption because, due to the materiality thresholds, uh, this may imply that subsidiaries that are relevant uh, on their own will will get uh, somehow lost in the big picture of the consolidated group. However, I think that very much reflects a, a view of materiality that is not the view that is an enshrined in the NFRD, but also in the future even more under the CSRD. So under financial materiality, I would argue, I would agree that uh, you might lose relevant information because of uh, blunt uh, thresholds, uh, quantitative thresholds that will, will make some information immaterial. However, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to uh, social aspects, uh, I would argue that even small breaches uh, occurring at subsidiary level, uh, if they're against the code of conduct of the company or even you know, breaches of applicable law, this should be disclosed at group level because that will uh, impact the reputation of the group as a whole. So I think we need to think about materiality uh, uh, in, in a different way. Uh, direction and that obviously will have a reflection on uh, how much of, uh, of the uh, subsidiary level is reflecting in the consolidated level. So I'm, I'm uh, more positive on, on this. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, Rami, there's one question for you, uh, picking up, Hilda is picking up on your point that these things have not come in a way that you, in sort of a linear way that we would have maybe otherwise would have designed it if the world would allow for that. What do you think the implications of that are? And I'm I'm going to ask you to take sort of um, one minute because this will also be the last question before we go to uh, the next panel. Yeah, sure, and I, and I think it can be it can be also uh, answered in the in the next panel because it's will question of how the the standard will cope to this. But 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 actually the in the regulation we we already have requirement there are indicators that that are required in in the SFDR uh, some are obligatory. So I guess. It have to to be uh, taken into account in the in the standard going forward, so that we we can have the information. Uh, the, the, maybe the the trickiest one is is the taxonomy because it's very granular in terms of uh, analysis and reporting, and it can lead to a uh, sum of uh, interpretation uh, issue question. Uh, that and I think it will be worth to 
to as it's implemented to feed the the work of the various stakeholders uh, so that we take the the learning of it and and make sure that that it it fits well. Uh, having said that, um, uh, just mentioned the the the. the a lot of things has will have to be done in the in the, in the standard, uh, so it's a bit challenging. But but uh, what has been achieved with the task force of EFRAG uh, is is remarkable uh, in a short period of time. So maybe we can be uh, optimistic uh, in, in the future uh, going forward. All right. Thank you, Rami. Um, I would really like to thank uh, my panelists for being so clear, concise, uh, and forthcoming with your with your comments and interventions. Um, there are questions in the chat that are left unanswered. Um, apologize for that, but if there are people from the panel that feel that they can still pick up those questions in the chat, that is, of course, most welcome. Um, Olivier, uh, a quarter to the hour, it's over to you. Gerbrandt, thank you very much. I'm very impressed uh, on how you kept the time, so I think you've set the bar very high. Uh, and I think your panel actually has set the bar very high, uh, very good discussion, a very consensual discussion as well. Uh, seems to me that everyone you know, at least would agree that in an ideal world, uh, we would have one standard. Uh, I've long learned that the world is far from ideal anyway, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, but I, I think it was interesting to see that one of the points of consensus in your panel was that the second panel will solve all the issues related to standard setting. So I think that is really setting the bar very high. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Olivier. I'm the Chief Executive of Accounts Europe. It's a great pleasure for me to host this fantastic panel that is going to solve all the issues of the world. And maybe to start uh, you know, with this discussion on standard setting and how we're gonna make standard setting uh, work, I just like to repeat, if I'm allowed, uh, some of the words that uh, Elena actually outlined in her presentation. I think around the specific needs of the EU, uh, we yes, we do have a number of specific regulation in the EU, uh, we do have a very strong demand, actually, from stakeholders uh, for standards. And we're taking, I'm sure Patrick will even put more flesh on these bones and, and detail this, but we're also taking a specific approach, uh, really articulated around double materiality and being really stakeholder centric. So my you know, take on that is that we are taking a transformative approach, not a business as usual approach. And everybody, including on the first panel, has been talking about co-construction. So uh, what we're going to have now is a conversation on end not a conversation around or, or a conversation against. We're going to have a conversation on how we make this little adverb and work uh, as regards standard setting. Um, and to do that for us, I have, must say a fantastic panel uh, and uh, I will introduce the panelists one after the other. We will start with Monsieur Patrick de Cambourg, uh, who is uh, actually the president of the French uh, Accounting Standards Center. But today on this panel, uh, Patrick is really the chair of the European Lab Project Task Force on EU non-financial reporting standards. So uh, Patrick, thank you very much. You've had a very busy agenda and it's great that you're today with us. I think you've got seven minutes, Patrick. The floor is yours. And you need to unmute. <laughs> thank you for, thank you, Olivier, for reminding me. Um, uh, good, uh, good morning. <laughs> I, I'm on mute. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, we Hello? can hear you. It's perfect. Please carry on. Do you hear me? This is good. We we can hear you. The line could be better. Uh, maybe a problem with my earbuds. I uh, just it's better without. Thank you. Patrick, we can hear you. Okay. So uh, good morning to you all. Um, <clears throat> I know the world is uh, nothing but. Uh, OK, fine. Thank you. The world is not perfect and ideal. You said it, <clears throat> but we are going to try to move in the right direction under an end strategy rather than an or strategy. 
Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to <clears throat> highlight maybe uh, the four key points that are in the uh, task force report, <clears throat> which was prepared. <clears throat> apologies, which was prepared by the uh, 35 members and the nine observers under a consensus uh, type approach, which is uh, dear to the heart of EFRAG. Um, quickly, um, we, we have worked on the foundations, what we call the foundations, i.e. the landscape in which the standard setting will have to, to evolve. And we have spotted, uh, in order to have a proper accountable uh, standard setting and probably in the EU, six key points which I would like to quickly uh, uh, quote. Need to support the implementation of public policies and also private strategies with high quality sustainability information. The second is uh, the willingness to build on and contribute to international progress in co-construction mode. Third, the need to provide financial institutions that was mentioned in the previous panel with quality data in order for, in order for them to deploy their sustainable finance policies, including reporting. Uh, fourth, the willingness to involve the economy as a whole, including SMEs in a proportionate manner. Uh, five, the importance of sector specific sustainability reporting as a complement to sector agnostic. And six, the crucial role of intangibles in value creation and sustainable development. This is not standard setting per se, but this is what is the platform on which standard setting has to operate in our view in the EU. Then, of course, any standard setting activity has to build from what is called in our language of standard setters, uh, a conceptual framework. And uh, the conceptual framework has to be fully aligned with the EU underlying uh, the, uh, under a public regime, because uh, the standard setting in the EU is publicly accountable and, and is organized, by the way, <coughs> in the draft uh, CSR to be elaborated under the umbrella of the public institutions that will adopt it via delegated acts. So let me mention a few points that are, uh, in my view, clear in terms of concepts and which need to be uh, addressed in the process. Double materiality is key. That has been mentioned already. By that, uh, it means that sustainability reporting should cover risk and opportunities for the reporting entity, as well as impacts of the reporting entity on the environment and society. The two dimensions cannot be and should be considered at the same time, bearing in mind this is a point to consider when co-constructing. Connectivity is also key. Corporate reporting uh, must walk on two legs based on good standards. The continuity between financial reporting and sustainability reporting is to be seamless both ways. Finally, quality is of utmost importance. It is time sustainability information becomes really relevant, faithful, comparable, understandable and verifiable. And therefore, and therefore, established on an equal footing with financial reporting. Then, of course, um, the, 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 the third key point uh, in the proposals is the uh, uh, comprehensive coverage of sustainability matters, which is which was expected from the, 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 the directive and which is confirmed, by the way, with the draft. The target architecture of standards that we propose is therefore based on what we call an ESG plus classification with the related subtopics, aiming at reporting on all key sustainability, sustainability matters important under the development materiality approach. This is pretty ambitious. Information should, in our view, cover strategy implementation, including targets and scenarios to reflect what Rami was saying, and performance measurement in a forward-looking manner. Finally, we recommend to consider standardized sustainability reporting as an identifiable section of the management report, possibly called the sustainability statements, which would be the counterpart of 
and in interaction with the financial statements. Patrick, All of this is fine, pretty okay. ambitious, a target, ambitious, uh, ambitious, bearing in mind the ambitious goals. What is the problem? Excuse me. Well, the, the sound you don't is, hear me? The sound is not very good, Patrick. So perhaps you've got, to... you've got a good 30 seconds left. And I think so that we hear your conclusion very loud and clear. Is it OK now? Is it better? I think it sounds much better. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Is it better? I... It's better. Thank you. It is um, better. So timing is of the essence because there is a first, uh, first because there is a first set of standards to be delivered in 2022, which is like tomorrow, for implementation in 2023, uh, on 2023, early 2024. So now maybe a quick word on the uh, governance of EFRAG, which was covered by Jean-Paul Gauzet's report. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, financial reporting leg on IFRS is to remain absolutely unchanged. No change here. What is proposed by Jean-Paul is the creation of a second leg for the elaboration of standards under uh, mirroring somehow the processes, but of course with a different goal because it's elaborating that, that rather than you know giving advice for uh, on something that is uh, on standards that we, that have been elaborated by other by another organization. <clears throat> In this context. Uh, uh, th there is a, a change of, of uh, an evolution in the governance, and I can assure that if you read the report in details, the, there are many precautions in terms of governance, the balance of public and private representations, and also due process uh, in order to make sure that the standards that will be elaborated and then transmitted to the Commission for adoption by a delegated act are of, a, of an international quality. Under co-construction, co but I suspect that we will have an opportunity to, to answer some questions on this one once Michel Madelin has, uh, uh, has, has said uh, what he wanted to, to say. Sorry, thank you. Apologies for the connection. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I think we clearly heard your last words. Uh, is that okay? I think that's okay. And it is basically applying back the ball into Michel's camp uh, to start the conversation on co-construction. So uh, it's a great pleasure, actually, to welcome Michel Madelin, who is the chair of the nominating committee of the uh, IFRS Foundation. Uh, so nominations is going to be instrumental into getting co-construction work because co-construction is really a mindset. But I think we would very much like to hear your views, uh, Michel, on, on how we're going to make this end conversation work. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Olivier. Can you hear me well? That's perfect. OK, thank you. So I may disappoint you because I, I will not speak about nomination, actually. I will speak about the project itself and, you know, what we're trying to do and where we are. But uh, uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's very clear that uh, and we, we that Europe has a very um, leading and ambitious uh, agenda on sustainability and that Europe needs uh, reporting standards that are consistent with that ambition but also its legal framework. And it's also uh, something you know that other countries or other jurisdictions are also embarking on a similar journey. So, you know, at the same time, we know that there's a broad consensus uh, on the need for a global solution. I think that has been said and, and endorsed by, by many. Now, this is particularly true for capital market where completeness, quality, and consistency of information is today impeding the ability of the private sector to make investment and to drive meaningful progress toward net zero across the global economy. So, you know, Europe is important, but Europe is not everything. So we need a global approach is, is, is critical. So the question we all face today is how we accommodate the uh, global and jurisdiction, jurisdictional initiatives, which have different level of ambitions across different jurisdictions, different target audiences, 
different sets of objectives. Some relate to the information needs of capital providers, others to a much broader set of stakeholders or to public policy objective as um, Patrick just mentioned. And I think the, the conclusion we came to or we reached is that we cannot with a single disclosure standard address all these objectives. And we need to be, uh, to be effective, we need to be very, uh, I would say surgical in setting the objective for what we're trying to do. So what we're proposing is to develop what we call a high quality global baseline of corporate level reporting for capital providers that will benefit from widespread and global adoption. That's what we're trying to do. And one that meets fully its state objective, which I mentioned before, but also one that is fully compatible and interoperable with um, what others the jurisdiction would want to do and does not constrain in any way the ambition of jurisdiction, such as the European Union, that want to go further or faster, or indeed other international initiatives that have a broader set of stakeholders. But what we want is to develop something that can be uh, reflected to uh, and endorsed or incorporated into these uh, regional or, or, or national standards. So in order to do that, we believe we need to have a very dynamic and agile approach based on constructive cooperation and engagement with all jurisdiction and relevant stakeholders, among which importantly, IFRAG and the European Commission. So this is this approach which we, believe, we see as demand driven and uh, I will explain why, um, that I and my fellow trustees and the FRS Foundation have taken in our work on sustainability reporting. And that's the approach that has received the support of IOSCO, the FSB, and a number of established initiatives. Now, let me say a few words about where we are and what is left to do, uh, a lot, in fact. So last week, we published a feedback statement that summarized the feedback we received and how as trustees responded to that feedback. And I think we made five important decisions I'd just like to quickly comment on. The first, is our focus will be um, on information needs of investors and other participants in the world capital markets to accurately assess the impact of sustainability issues on, uh, on companies' ability to create and preserve enterprise value over the short, medium, and long term. So enterprise, enterprise value being a key concept. In that, when we think about enterprise value, and that's a question we, we I'm sure we'll come back to at some point, we recognize that materiality, which has been often you know, promoted as a source of uh, differentiation, is a very dynamic concept. And that the gap between enterprise value, value-oriented standards, and those that adopt double materiality perspective may not be as large as often complemented and may vary across uh, different topics. In terms of what we want to cover, we said we would want to cover climate first, but not climate only. And that's a very important point. We share the view that we, we need to address uh, the demands of, of the investor community, what is relevant for the investor community. And in that context, um, all topics uh, need to be considered, but there is a real sense of urgency on climate and that's where we want to initially focus. So um, we are you know, working on this with established organization. And one of the topic we are addressing is what can we do actually to while we prioritize climate, make sure we don't leave uh, un, uh, unaddressed the other topics. Uh, an important point we, we have decision we've made is, is really to um, build on existing framework and existing work. Uh, we're not here to add another set of standards. We want to capitalize as much on the work that has been done. Uh, we've uh, responded by putting together a working group that I chair. Uh, we have representation from international standard setters that are focused on enterprise value, TSCFD, um, the Value Reporting Foundation, reporting SASB and IRC, the World Economic Forum, CDSB, and we have also um, IOSCO and EISB uh, participating in that process. We also have engagement with GRI and CDP. So the idea here is really there is strong desire and goodwill among all participants to move at pace and to provide this new board with the running start capitalizing on, on what has already been developed. So blending and building out both on the resource, the talent and the intellectual capital of, of 
this existing organization is a critical part of the process. Um, we'll talk about that, but there is a concept we're promoting of building block approach. This is really, again, uh, the idea is that uh, for, the, for what we are focusing on, we want to minimize the difference with regional and other initiative. Uh, we want to work in close cooperation to ensure compatibility and interoperability. Um, and really our target outcome here is to provide capital providers with the necessary information to, accru to assess this impact of sustainability issues and to do that not only on a regional basis, but to do that on a global basis. And we believe that's the way forward. Uh, we are working on developing various level channels of engagement, uh, working with AOSCO, we have introduced this concept of multi-stakeholder multi group, which is really designed to bring both civil society and other uh, multilateral organizations into the process and, and contribute to the development of the standard. So that's uh, where we are today. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of work in front of us, a lot of condition, precondition that are necessary for us to move forward with these projects have yet to be met, uh, but we believe that this can be done and we committed really to move forward on the basis I just described. And again, with a high level of cooperation engagement with uh, Europe in this initiative. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Michel. And, and thank you to the two of you actually for sharing such an insight into your respective work. I think that's, that was very useful. Th thank you also for being so open to working you know, or exchanging uh, together. I think that's really what we wanted to hear. Uh, when, when I made a reference to your role in the nomination committee, Michel, I think I just wanted to hint to the fact that cooperation is based on human beings talking to one another, as we do today, and people are essential, as we say in accounts, yeah. here, people count. Uh, you, you guys might know uh, that Brussels is deconfining, so I would very much... Uh, like to invite the two of you to join us in Accounts Europe and meet together uh, because that's the small bit that you didn't really talk about. Uh, how are you going to make that co-construction cooperation work in practice? So we'll get back to that, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, now we're going to have uh, the pleasure of listening to uh, stakeholders and, and Andy Goodhall uh, from the World Benchmarking Alliance. Uh, will now share our remarks. Emily, uh, thank you very much for being on the panel and please tell the gentleman uh, how we want them to cooperate. <laughs> thank you so much, Olivier, and thank you to everyone who's uh, already spoken. So I think it's fair to say this is an extraordinarily exciting time, but also an extraordinarily challenging time. So to your point, Olivier, about well, human beings, we all today on this call are lucky to continue to connect and have these conversations from the luxury of our own homes, but the many cannot. Um, the context is that global inequality is continuing to rise, of course, greatly exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, whilst rich or poor, we collectively face a global existential threat. We're on a path to unprecedented global warming, biodiversity loss at an exponential rate, and these global challenges pose a threat to us all, um, whether that's the future viability of our economic system, the, the companies that are operating within it globally and the financial institutions that enable them in, the, in turn. So it's in that context, it is absolutely necessary we have the shared basis for understanding and articulating how and where these issues are financially material to the lens that Michelle just mentioned, the IFRS and working my, with IOSCO and many others is proposing to apply in setting out these globally consistent, comparable, reliable sustainability disclosure standards that we all want. It's also in that context absolutely necessary, arguably for investors as well as wider stakeholders, to understand how the private sector is contributing to these issues and what actions specifically they're taking to mitigate these risks or to maximise the positive outcomes. And that is not historically a lens that investors as an industry overall has applied. So this is really a big transition. So the launch of the CSRD in that context is a landmark moment. I think we all recognise that as mandatory disclosure is critical in raising the floor and voluntary standards, so wonderful to see the developments from IFRS, are essential in then informing those industry norms and often in informing then the regulation and policy that we need. And we've heard calls for more of, and that includes mandatory reporting, of course. And all of this really matters 
Um, just last month, academic research was published indicating just how mandatory ESG disclosure has a positive real world effect. It reduces both significance and number of ESG incidents. And encouragingly, this is research that was you know, from global academics and reflecting global incidents. So at WBA, we are hugely welcoming both these developments as necessary, but also recognise, I think to Rami's point earlier, that they're not sufficient for the true transformations that we all need. So forgive me, Olivier, if I'm somewhat idealist in this perspective, but we need to raise those aspirations further. So without a collective North Star, we also risk lacking a shared ambition against which we can assess that performance on sustainability. With sustainability performance too often assessed, often by investors well in relation to peers or to past performance, that tends to be our definition of performance in the industry, as opposed to in line with what people and planet actually need. So in the AND spirit, Olivier, at WBA through the Alliance, of which many of you are part, we see our role as complementary to those voluntary and mandatory disclosure standards in raising the bar and in keeping in sight as this collective North Star, a world in which we can live within planetary boundaries, here's the idealism, and one in which no one is left behind, if we have the language of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And our contribution to this as WBA is through the seven system transformation methodologies that some of you are familiar with, and our commitment to hold the private sector accountable by assessing and ranking 2,000 of the world's most influential companies on their progress in contributing to those transformations. So it's really welcome that CSRD anticipates future corporate reporting to align with the SDGs. And we call, as some have already, for more explicit linking of corporate sustainability reporting to actual sustainability goals. And as recognised, I think, by the IFRS direction of travel, Financial institutions in particular have a very powerful role to play here in advocating for the greater uptake of a shared ambition, in systematic uptake of the relevant associated tools and disclosure frameworks. And ultimately, we want all of that because we want action. But we also need greater consistent comparable disclosure from the financial institutions themselves if we're to meet these transformations. And it's for this reason that at WBA, we're developing a financial system transformation benchmark focused on 400 globally influential financial institutions, whether they're asset owners, asset managers, banks, insurers, to look at the steps that they're taking to be positive contributors to these transformations. The draft methodology on that will be published next month, and we really will welcome feedback far and wide. Because secondly, in terms of the necessary but not sufficient point, we do need to move, as we've been discussing, and this panel is all about, from an EU or US-centric approach, whether that's real or perceived. And whether that's voluntary or mandatory, Different regional approaches do create a patchwork that risks allowing multinationals, many of whom we see are the most influential in any given system, to defer to the lowest common denominator. And we've heard consistently in our consultations the conflicting priorities and emphases felt in different regions of the world, including around this topic of climate change, which is often really a discussion around climate change mitigation, and to what extent that reflects the priorities and power concentration in the global north not the global south, where perhaps climate adaptation is today's reality, as is the need for a fair and just transition, access to water, clean air, economic opportunities to combat poverty, pervasive equality in all its forms. So this co-creation of a new approach or co-construction, to Patrick de, de Gambo's points, is about truly bringing in global voices and aligning to SDGs. And I think that's something that we all of us have a role in advocating for. So very interested, Olivier, to see where the discussion goes and to hear ideas and reflections on this today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for bringing social inequality. Uh, there is some echo, is there? Th thank you for bringing you know, uh, the point on social inequalities, I think, in, into the equation here today, uh, because I think you know, everybody has realized it is key to the acceptance of public policies regarding you know, the transition that we need to make. But I think it's equally key to the acceptance of financial markets. We should not forget that as well. Uh, there is one point on which, I, if I may, I would like to disagree with you, Emily, already, uh, which is that you, you talked about the planetary boundaries being ideal. Uh, I don't think it's an ideal. I think it's a vital necessity. Uh, but I think that's what you wanted to say. So we're probably fully in agreement. Uh, I think we've all also noticed in the past 10 years that the world has moved east, as everybody has said. So I'm very happy today to have the privilege of welcoming Mr. Satoshi Ikeda, 
who is the Chief Sustainable Finance Officer of the Financial Services Agency of Japan, uh, a country I love very much, I must confess. Uh, Mr. Satoshi Ikeda, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Olivier, for that kind of introduction. Um, well, Emily uh, uh, made input uh, to this discussion from a certain global perspective. Uh, I'll do so, uh, but uh, from a bit different angle. Um, as the I am from the uh, Japan Financial Services Agency, uh, which is a securities regulator uh, in Japan, and also as I'm living in Japan, I'm from obviously from Asia. So, um, well, in terms of the developing the uh, sustainability reporting standards and frameworks, uh, it is very critical for uh, countries uh, in the Asia region that we uh, would have a, a, a consistent, a harmonized uh, framework uh, applied uh, globally. Uh, uh, not what we don't want uh, is that the market fragmentation uh, uh, in terms of the sustainability reporting standards. And from that uh, uh, point of view, well, certainly uh, I admire uh, the ambition uh, of the European Union and the, uh, I really commend the product uh, recently published, uh, CSRD, uh, in, in, in uh, bringing in the uh, uh, many uh, 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 push forward for uh, uh, sustainability uh, uh, reporting uh, uh, arena. But at the same time, um, from the Asian perspective, the sustainability reporting so far uh, have been promoted uh, in the region uh, as a, a, a rules of the stock exchange, uh, uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange, Hong Kong, Singapore, all uh, uh, apply that the requirement of the sustainability reporting uh, as a rule of stock exchange. So their focus uh, is uh, investor uh, and also on financial materiality. So. I have to say that the, uh, there is a huge gap between such approach uh, and the uh, EU's approach in the CSRD. Uh, well, CSRD is advocating the double maturity concept. Uh, and well, I often say that uh, it is a ice cream strategy. Uh, well, if you are asked about uh, well, uh, 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 no, the, which ice cream you should take, single or double? Well, people tend to say double because it can uh, give you a multiple flavor. But uh, um, in, in the case of the uh, uh, materiality discussion, well, the, the distinction between single and double is not so uh, obvious, as Michel explained, that the there's a certain dynamic materiality concept, and so materiality concept, even uh, in the context of financial materiality, can evolve uh, 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 according to the uh, of which industry the company belongs to, or also the from time to time. So, I I, I, I think the that is why the lower of IFRS foundations. Uh, move uh, 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 is critical, and and to in and to bridge that gap. Um, well, in the end, uh, we do need to care about the uh, materiality to the environment and the society. But the route to read there uh, uh, is, I believe, through fast uh, financial materiality. So. Um, through the financial materiality angle, the companies can incorporate the sustainability issues into their uh, capital investment, decision making, risk management processes. And as the concept of a, a materiality 
evolves dynamically, it certainly expands the scope of the disclosure by those companies uh, uh, in terms of the uh, materiality to the society and the environment. So we need to start with the uh, 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 flexible framework uh, and also not only focusing on industry agnostic approach, but a industry specific approach. So as the concept of materiality uh, could uh, uh, be different uh, by company by company in terms of financial materiality. So we need to accommodate uh, those uh, flexibility in the uh, sustainability reporting uh, standards. And I believe that the IFRS Foundation uh, is moving uh, 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 towards uh, that direction. And that is certainly uh, set a uh, 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 path uh, uh, towards the uh, 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 expanded concept of materiality in the end. So, well, I really hope that the uh, uh, through the building blocks approach advocated by the IFAS Foundation, also the IOSCO, uh, CSRD framework and FRAC's role and IFAS Foundation's uh, role uh, coexist harmoniously so that the uh, uh, global uh, consistency of the sustainability uh, reporting standards and frameworks will be ensured. And in that, on that point, uh, I, I'm acting as the uh, uh, co-chair of the Disclosure Working Group of the International Platform on Sustainable Finance, or IPSF. And we are now uh, 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 making a survey of the uh, IPSF member jurisdictions how to address the uh, sustainability uh, reporting from the perspective of double materiality. And so, well, certainly uh, I hope that the, that work would uh, help uh, 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 that the alignment and the and convergence uh, uh, work uh, between the IFAS Foundation and the uh, and the uh, European Un uh, Union's initiative on on, on sustainability building. Thank you. I pause here. Thank you very much, Satoshi. And, and uh, I hope you can turn your camera on when we have the discussion, because uh, we don't have a lot of questions in the chat. But I would still like to have a discussion, uh, and maybe I will start by asking a question to Patrick. Uh, Patrick, do you like ice cream? Because yes, I, I, <clears throat> I, I like ice cream and I like, I, I like a mix. Yes. <laughs> Could you actually elaborate? And, and that's a question I would like to ask all the panelists because I think Satoshi made a very important point. And I would even invite Elena from the previous panel to feel free to step in if she so uh, wishes. But considering you seem to like double ice creams, Patrick, can you elaborate on how we can coordinate, co-construct, combine uh, this financial materiality approach with the European double materiality approach? When will they converge in a way? Well, you know, in order to, in order to move forward uh, in an end strategy with, with you know, two, two uh, to uh, a, a double ice cream, uh, we, we need to have a clear discussion about the goals of, of each and every initiative. Because if you don't start with a clear picture of the end game, then, you know, co-construction has to start from a global architecture. And, and, and the pieces that you are building either together or separately uh, have to be derived from a an allocation of tasks, in my view. It can be joint projects, it can be, you know, an allocation of tasks, someone doing something and, and the other person doing something that is complementary and they, they interact and, and, and are inter interoperable. So we, we, we first need to have a, a thorough discussions. By the way, the task force with the Commission had already two meetings with major international initiatives, one mid-December and one 
on March 22nd. The first one was to, to, uh, to have a better picture over what was happening in each and every initiative. And the, third, the second one in March was to pave the way to uh, the uh, analysis of possible cooperation uh, uh, projects. And, exactly. uh, and we have to have now bilateral discussions and also maybe more global as well in order to see how, you know, co-construction is a word that is flying around. A building block is a terminology that is, that is flying around too. Uh, I think we need clarity on this. What does it mean? Because if the idea is that some people do something and then all, all other jurisdictions are free to add or to subtract, I don't think that's the best way to converge. Uh, Co-constructing means to, to, as I said, uh, yeah. a target architecture. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm careful about, you know, financial materiality being separated from uh, the other materiality. I think every phenomenon, as, as soon as you consider that financial reporting is reasonably stabilized with clear concepts that are embedded in the conceptual framework of the ISB, you need to be careful before destabilizing that, yep. which, uh, which, is, which is based upon, you know, cash outflows and inflows, probability of inflows, etc. That's good. So sustainability reporting starts when financial reporting uh, stops. And therefore, each and every phenomenon needs to be analyzed from a double perspective. What is the impact on society and environment? And what is the potential risk that is derived from that uh, from a financial perspective? And as it has been said, it varies over time. And therefore, be careful about segregating. That's what I wanted to say. Thank, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I'm afraid we're running a little bit out of time. So uh, I'll, just to reassure you, I will tell you that uh, you will hear from Accounts Europe on how we can foster you know, these co-construction building blocks, whatever it's called, uh, because it is extremely important. Can, can I have perhaps the remarks of the other panelists very, very shortly? And, and Satoshi, if I may, I, I think there is a question specifically for you on the impact outside of Europe in the chat, so we'll get back to you. Uh, perhaps Emily and Michelle first on, on co-construction. Ladies first, Emily. Thank you, Olivier. And I'm just looking to Lara's comments. Thank you, Lara. In the chat, isn't co-construction equal to have a shared vision of a problem and its solution? I couldn't agree more. So I think that's where, from our perspective, it's about the North Star. What is the collective North Star? You know, and you heard what I had to say. I think there's the best business plan we have from a sustainability development perspective is the SDGs. So, you know, to what extent can we co-construct around those goals? Thank you very much for that. That was a clear and snappy answer. Michel, what is your contribution to this? Well, I, I, thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. I think from my perspective, I think, you know, we have set out clearly what where we think the IFRS can play a role. And, you know, and we also recognize that there is a much wider set of ambitions and, and objectives that are legitimate and need to be addressed. Uh, I don't think it's our role to actually interfere or, 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 or step into the construction of these uh, type of uh, standards. What we want to make sure is that what we're trying to do here is actually compatible and can be integrated into uh, the broader setup that various jurisdictions, including Europe, are able to do. But uh, and, uh, so I think that it would be very critical for us to really remain very much focused on the objective we set for ourselves and, and recognizing the limitation, but recognize also that in no way they should be impeding on the ability or the capacity of others to expand and build on those. Th thank you very much. And I'm going to sacrifice the time of my closing remarks uh, so that we can just continue this discussion for a few more seconds. Uh, and I will ask a very easy question to Satoshi, a uh, question uh, that actually was already in the first uh, uh, panel and that Gerda very kindly referred to us. 
uh, Satoshi, what do you think uh, the impact of standards and the directive uh, in the EU will have outside of the EU on businesses uh, that are not operating or listed in the EU? Very simple question. You've got 15 seconds to answer. There you go. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, I, I'm afraid that the, well, if the IFRS Foundation's uh, standard uh, comes into the, uh, existence, I believe that the uh, many uh, major corporations in Asia will follow that rather than the CSRD. That is my hype. So, uh, so well, EU has certainly playing a very important role in promoting sustainable finance related standards, but uh, maybe in terms of the uh, reporting standards, uh, I'm afraid it, 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 not, it might not be the case. Thank you very much. That, that was indeed almost 15 seconds. Uh, so I still have a few seconds for my closing remark. And, and at least I think I should really uh, extend a very warm thanks uh, to all our speakers. Uh, I think uh, you've done a fantastic job. I, I just like to say that it's been a great pleasure uh, to cooperate uh, with the World Benchmarking Alliance on, on this discussion. The discussion is far from closed, uh, obviously. So we will speak again, and I hope we will cooperate again. Um, I would, in particular, regarding the speakers, like to extend special thanks, actually, to Patrick and to Elena, uh, because the directive has just been released, the report has just been released, and I have a bit of a feeling of what it must have been like. So uh, thank you very much for making the time after working so hard uh, for this conversation. Uh, a pretty consensual conversation at the end of the day, uh, I thought. I mean, we, we heard uh, a lot of, of very you know, shared understanding on uh, the needs of the EU uh, and of the need for standards also to report on the CSRD, the taxonomy. I think that, that was very you know, uh, clear. Also a very clear message, I thought, in the first panel on the need uh, to move to reasonable assurance fairly fast, fairly quickly. Uh, and I think that was a code uh, in a number of instances. So uh, very good conversation also on that front. Um, I just like to bring this back perhaps uh, in a slightly bigger picture. Uh, because I think, especially in Europe, we have a fantastic talent to debate and debate and debate. And I think we need to put this debate in the context of the need for action. I think Michel was very right in a way, reminding us that it is not only about climate, but that climate is very important. Well, indeed, I think if you put that into the bigger picture, I'm afraid, based on conversations with a number of people from the IPCC, that we probably have already missed the 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement. That is not good news. That is really not good news. We have a small chance, however, but a very small chance, to be able to meet the two degree uh, target uh, that uh, uh, you know, we have in mind as well. That requires moving uh, with radical and bold action, and in a very, very short time frame. And in all honesty, that's not what we're doing now, uh, because right now, if we carry on, the projections of the UN are that we are on track for a four to five degrees warming. That means something we just can't cope with. So, Fantastic debate today. I uh, really appreciated the contribution of all speakers, even more appreciated the work that you're putting into this. And a big call, uh, a big humble call uh, from me and everybody, I think, in Europe to accelerate the pace of change. Thank you very much. And thank you for to all in attendance. Bye bye. Oh, and by the way, one point I should have mentioned. Uh, the recording uh, for uh, this event will be made available shortly. You will receive a link. Uh, I'm afraid some of you may have missed the beginning of the conversation. So it's been recorded. 
uh, and uh, we will share with you uh, the link uh, to this recording. Thank you very much again. Uh, we'll continue the conversation. Goodbye. And you can make a reservation in your favorite restaurant. It's already Sorry. made <laughs> for free, Michelle. I hope you will join. Goodbye.